You ready to get into the Word? All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for your Word, your promises. But Father, lead us, guide us, and, and teach us today, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes of our understanding to see and our ears to hear. But we declare we will be doers of the word. And Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ that we will drive a stake into fear, anxiety, and worry today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we give you praise for who you are. Thank you that we are your children. Thank you for all your promises in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Of course, I wrote this question out before all of this stuff was happening concerning what I'm teaching you. And the question is this, why is society today so full of fear, worry, anxiety, and so depressed? Well, one of the things that we know, fear uh, is, is just running rampant because everything that we watch on uh, the TV, if you watch TV, everything that you watch on TV, it's all fear-based. Everything is fear-based. I mean, if the stock market gets a little bit of fear, it'll dip lower than snuff. I mean, it will go down, it will go down so far, and it's messy, and, and, and people, because it operates on fear. Listen, the whole system in the world operates on fear. And it's amazing how much money people make on our fear. You know, you can't turn on TV today without seeing commercial after commercial after commercial with all kinds of symptoms, and you're sitting there analyzing yourself, thinking, okay, I think I have one of those. You know, and, and, then, and then we wonder why our faith is not working. So if we want to understand the origin of where fear comes from, what, how it produces, and, and, and it is, is the instigator, the spirit of fear. Remember, I, ta- I taught you last week, you can go back and listen to it. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But the spirit, sp- fear is spiritual, so it is a spirit of fear. That's what God said, okay? So fear is the instigator of anxiety and worry. Fear is the one who writes on, the, on our minds, on our souls, would begin to write as a, as a producer or director or writer of a movie starts to write. And fear will start writing these things uh, by the way of thoughts in our minds and wants us to become the lead actor. And then fear knows that if it can, it, it can uh, in, get us into the place where we are the lead actor, once we start acting, we're going to have an effect on other people. So, if you want to know how fear came about, where do you go? All the way back to the beginning of where we find fear began. So, therefore, let's go to Genesis, the third chapter. Amen. Genesis, the third chapter, verse 9 through 11. I don't have time to read all of Genesis, the third chapter, but you know in Genesis 3, you find that Adam and Eve are being tempted by the devil and they give in to this temptation and so when they give in to this temptation they find out a course which he always does the devil was lying and so when the Lord shows up because the Lord always showed up to have fellowship and relationship with them so when the Lord shows up in verse 9 he says then the Lord called to Adam and said to him where are you Now, you know God knew where he was. But I I think this, I think because when you study this out, that those words, where are you in the Hebrew, you'll find out that it indicates that not only is he talking about a geographical place where, where Adam could be hiding, that he chose to hide, you can't hide from God, but it also means this. It means, where are you in your relationship with me right now? Where are you concerning, and listen to this, where are you concerning your identity right now? Because it's changed. Because when God created everything, it was good. 
When God created the earth, he put everything here, everything, for Adam and Eve. And not only for Adam and Eve, but for the millions upon millions of people that would be on this earth, billions of people would be on this earth. God created the earth to sustain and to take care of no matter how many people showed up to meet every single need. There was nothing that Adam could say, uh, Lord, I think you forgot this. No, everything. And, and, and let me jump over into the New Testament because in the New Testament, God makes this statement. He says, I have given you everything. Through Jesus, I have given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. He didn't leave one thing out. Whatever you have need of, he said, I've already given it to you. Now, you got to know how to receive it. That's the key. So he said this. He said, so, see, Adam, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, watch this, who told you that you were naked? Well, there's only three of them there. So knowing, listen to this now, knowing and understanding the character of the devil, once they bit on and took his lie, took the trap, got his lie, can you imagine what the enemy said to them? And you're going to see this in just a minute because the word naked does not mean that you just had no clothes on. It goes much deeper than that. So he said, who told you? And the word, when you look at that statement, who told you, in the Hebrew it means this, who declared something to you? Who published something to you that you did not know? So he said, who told you that you were naked? And then he said this, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And and listen to me very carefully. It had nothing to do with the fruit. Even though the fruit is on the tree, the tree was a place of obedience or disobedience. God had given man and woman free will. And he had to allow them to obey him because there had to be obedience. They, they had, he had to put a place. It could have been a bridge. Don't cross this bridge. But it happened to be the tree. And when it says the tree of good and evil, it means this. When you eat it, that means you have sinned against me. And once sin comes in, all of a sudden you're going to be filled with evil. evil. That's the reason we have a sinful nature when we're born in this earth. We have the nature after Satan. And so now they know evil. They know good and they, go and, and they know evil. But what is amazing to me is that once they sin, the love that they knew was like erased. And now instead of responding to God, knowing that God is love and responding to him, they hide from him because now their makeup is full of fear. And they see God as now their enemy instead of the one who created them. So they run and they hide from him. And by the way, sin will always be full of guilt and shame and it will run and hide from God. But let me just say this to you. If you do sin, be like the prodigal. Don't run away from God, run back to him. Run to God. It is amazing because you're running into the arms of love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. So he said, have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Now they find themselves in this. They find themselves with a tormenting fear. They find themselves with a tormenting fear of judgment, punishment, and death. But you know what? When I, when I, when I look at these words and you see them on the screen... It is amazing to me that I see so many Christians still operating in this. Tormenting fear of judgment. I hear, I, I've heard people say this over and over again. Well, I sure hope I'm saved. 
No, you know you're saved because you did exactly what the Bible says. But people are so afraid of, of, of the judgment of God. So let me read something to you and punishment. How many times have you heard somebody, if an 18-wheeler ran a red light and somebody got killed, who got the blame for it? Most of the times, God. You don't hear people saying, the devil did that. You know, well, they must have sinned. They must have done something bad. You know, God just put that 18-wheeler through there and, or, 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 or this misconception. God just needed another angel. We are not angels. We are children of the living God. Angels are created by God, but they're not created in the image of God. We're the children of God created by God. You know, it's time that we recognize the one that has the power of death that comes to steal, kill, and destroy is the devil. It is not God. That will happen. That will happen. It is going to take place in the great tribulation. And I'm not saying that, that God cannot bring his judgment against w- wickedness. He still does that. If wickedness gets out of hand, he, he, he will do that. But Christians, listen to me. Born again believers, listen to this statement. 1 John 4, 18. Read it out of the Amplified Bible. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. Oh, man, I could, just, I could just stop right there and just start dancing and call the praise team out here and just say, I just want to just praise God. <laughs> there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But watch this. But perfect, that means complete and full grown. It means mature love. In other words, I have to grow in my knowledge and understanding of the love of God. Amen. This is what so many religious people and, and literally denominational people struggle with. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear. Man, when you're dealing with the symptoms of fear and you know how much God loves you, you'll take authority over it and say, fear in the name of Jesus, get out. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get out. Be gone. So he says, love drives out fear because... If you don't drive out fear, fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected, is not mature, has not grown in love, is is not perfected in love, has not grown, now watch this, in in a sufficient understanding of God's love. So if you're dealing with attacks constantly of fear, it's because you still are not operating in a revelation of how much God loves you. How deep. No wonder Paul prayed. And he prayed this in one of his prayers in the the book of Ephesians. He prayed, I pray that you would come to know the height, the width, the depth, and the breadth of God's love. I pray that over you almost every single day. That you'll you'll come to know that. So let's look. Let's go back to where Adam and Eve was. And so what was the lie of the devil? The lie of the devil was this to them. You don't need God. You can be God. You can make your own way. Do your own thing. You can create everything that you want or need. Because remember, you're going to be like God. You're going to be a God. You, you, you'll not have a care in this world. You'll be able to handle every situation just like God does. Every problem. You will not have any worries whatsoever. Yeah, only, only, only weak people need God. Man, Adam and Eve, you'll be completely self-sufficient. Adam, you'll be a superman. And Eve, you'll be a superwoman. You'll be invulnerable. Oh, you think that Wonder Woman is something? Oh, you'll go way beyond that. Oh, man, you'll be be incredible. You'll eat problems like it's chocolate candy. I love that little plaque that we have that Tava's put on our counter in the kitchen. She said, I would quit chocolate, 
but I am no quitter. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad she put that up there. Look at it every day, especially when I'm eating chocolate. Okay. So, so now watch this. Here's what the devil says, okay? devil gives all these promises. But let's look at Jesus' characterization of the devil. Let's look at John the 18th, the 8th chapter, John the 8th chapter, verse 44. Speaking of the devil, he's describing the devil. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. He has always hated the truth, which means he has always hated Jesus because Jesus said, I am the truth. And so therefore, he's always hated the word of God. Now, why does he hate the truth so much? Because if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And if you apply the truth, it will keep you free. Truth defeated him. He has no power over truth. No matter what fact you see, no matter what may be happening, truth is always more powerful than any fact that you face. The truth of God's word. And then Jesus said this, when he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the fathers and the father of lies. So what did he do? He lied to them about God. He lied to them about their new way of life. He lied to them about who they really were created to be and brought confusion in their mind and their identity. How much confusion do we see in the minds of people today? People can't even just really, I, I, think, I, I was thanking God for this doctor who's catching so much flack now, but this doctor said, biologically, when a child is born, they're either male or female. It's later on when somebody begins to w- operate and start putting thoughts in their minds that they become confused about whether they are biologically this or biologically that. Okay? It's simple. If you stand in front of a mirror, you got a stem, you're a male. If you don't have one, you're a female. You don't even have to go to the doctor for that. It's the reason you have mirrors. It's a very simple thing to see it. Anything else, listen to this, anything else, listen to me very carefully, anything else is a lie of the devil. Because God said, God said right here in Genesis, I created them male and female. Amen? Male and female. So so what happens? The devil comes in and the devil's still lying with people today and people are still believing the lies. So what does the Bible say about those lies? Listen to James the third chapter, verse 15 to 16. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So, Adam and, and watch this. Adam and Eve, listening to the devil, became envious of God. Wanted to be God. And then, out of, out of that envy came, or envy and jealousy, out of that envy and jealousy came self-seeking for themselves. And they found out that the devil was lying to them. Here's here's where the devil lies to the human race. And the devil is still propagating this. He's still announcing this. He's still publishing this. He's still speaking this not only to unbelievers but to believers. And here's the key. Adam, who told you that you were naked? Look at this definition of naked. Who told you that you were destitute? Who told you that you were abandoned? Who told you that you were cheap and despicable? See, you thought despicable was a movie. It started in the garden. The first one was in the garden. So he said, he, he said who told you that you were destitute? Who told you that you were abandoned? Who told you that you were cheap? Who told you that you were, uh, that you were despicable? And by the way, do you know what the word despicable means? It means I believe that I deserve to be hated and to to be treated with contempt. 
It's amazing because when you, when you talk to young people that when they were children were abused, they think they were bad. I, I, it must have happened because I'm just a bad person. I, I, I've heard that so many times. And I, and I look at them and I say, no, you're not the bad person. The bad person was the one who did what they did to you. That was the bad person. Don't now believe the lies of the devil because it's amazing. A bad person does something to somebody and then the devil gets on and starts accusing the person that it was done to as if it was their fault. I hate the devil and what he does. Now, listen, this started in the garden. This is, this, 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 is, this is what the devil said. You're good for nothing. You're inferior, insignificant, no account, unimportant. God is saying, who told you this? Unimportant, useless, worthless, valueless, irreverent, irreverent second rate, and meaningless. And that's where so many people see themselves. Without us saying it, we just kind of keep it inside. Remember the, the 12 spies when they went up? Uh, God told them, go in, take the land, I'm going to give it to you. And they went up and they didn't go in because of the way they saw themselves. We saw ourselves as grasshoppers. There were giants, but the giant is nothing but a little teeny speck of dust when it comes to God. There were giants, but they saw themselves and the way they saw themselves literally kept them, defeated them, and kept them from going in. And a lot of times, the, the, what keeps us from receiving from God, what keeps us from walking in and, and understanding this love of God, and what keeps us from walking in faith and being bold in our faith and who we are is because of the way we see ourselves, the way we have allowed people to speak to us and speak over us and, and plant seeds on the inside of us. And tell us you can't do this. You're insignificant. You're worth it. It is amazing how many people get saved, come into church, and sit there and never volunteer to serve because they feel like God can't use me after what I've been through and what I've done. That is so sad. Again, it's the lies of the devil. And we're going to kick over that sacred cow. We're not just going to kick over that sacred cow. We're going to butcher it, and we're going to eat some filet mignon. Amen? So, 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 but, but, but watch this, because this is so important. The other side of that, the other side of a lie is pride and arrogance and selfishness. Pride, lies, selfishness. All of a sudden, the pride of life, the pride of being like God, being equal with God, the pride, Adam and Eve. Oh, man, this is what we'll have. This is who we'll be. It's what, we'll, what we got. Always remember this. God never blesses pride. Matter of fact, he opposes it. That's the reason the Bible says he gives more grace to the humble. Not pride. You, everything that you do in your life, you've got to realize that it it comes from, if, it, if it's good and it's a blessing, it's coming from God. As a born again believer, you got to realize everything came from God. I mean, whose oxygen are you breathing right now? God, man didn't create this oxygen, God created this oxygen. It's just like, it's like the law of faith. We operate by faith, and it's a law, just like gravity. Gravity works. God put it in place. It works, and it will keep on working. You've never been riding down the road, and all of a sudden this beep, 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 and there's a gra gravity alert. In about 30 minutes, everyone that is 80 pounds and below had better be buckled up, held down, because there's a gravity alert. No. No, there's every other kind of alert you know, but you don't have that because it works. And it's the same thing with the law of faith. It works. 
But the, here's what, the enemy knows that his lies work. That's the reason he keeps bombarding people and he keeps throwing those lies into their head, especially when you run into trouble, you got situations going on. He's always there saying, no, you're not good for nothing. You're despicable. This is what's happened to you. Why did this happen to you? Because this, you haven't done enough. You haven't performed enough. You haven't prayed enough. You, you haven't read enough scripture. You haven't served enough. You haven't done this and you haven't done that. It is amazing how this devil is so smart and he can accuse us, oh, you've messed up. He will pull your file cabinet. When God has, has stamped canceled, 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 on everything, but the devil still pull your file cabinet, and you'll still do this. Because <laughs> we still allow him to take us back and believe those things instead of understanding the love of God, understanding the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. So man and woman, number two, man and woman in the whole human race is now carrying the burden of being their own gods. They're working hard now to provide. So they have to solve every problem. They're trying to remedy all the troubles, establishing their identity, trying to be perfect at the same time, hiding in fear all of our imperfections from everyone, just like Adam and Eve did. That's the reason I've told you over and over again, dating is a fraud. Why? Because it's the big cover-up. You're not going to let somebody know the real you. Because if you feel like they knew the real you, they wouldn't accept you. So you got to be somebody that you expect them to accept, and you won't be yourself. So what does that mean? That means you're all messed up and confused. It means that you're not even trusting God at all. And by the way, if you're trying to get everybody to like you, how's that working for you? You're not going to be able to get everybody to like you because the moment you try to get everybody to like you is the moment you're going to start living in compromise. You'll start compromising God's word and you'll allow the enemy just to mess your mind up and bring confusion in, in there. So we're still hiding and covering up. And by the way, when I said this, we're trying, we're trying to remedy all of our uh, problems and all of our uh, worries and all of our troubles. That's the reason we have the United Nations. That is man trying to remedy all the problems of the world apart from God. It doesn't work. So we're still hiding, covering up ourselves, fearful of rejection, lying to each other, doing anything and everything to be loved, and we have failed miserably carrying our, our anxieties and our worries, our cares, our shames, seeking peace in drugs, alcohol, false religions, fake and fraudulent relationships and, and are still failing even with all of our information, all of our education, all of our technological advancements, we're still failing. And failing worse now than everything. Oh, yeah, we got tremendous technology. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. But when it comes to man and to woman, we're failing miserably. Listen to me very carefully because this is one of the most important things that you will listen to. You, Adam and Eve, the whole human race, every single human being, especially you as a Christian, you and I were not created to carry all the burdens and all the cares of life. You were not created to do that. You can't do that. Your physical body cannot handle that. Your mind cannot handle that. And that's the reason that so many people are in mental hospitals and, 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 and taking drugs and all kinds of things because you're trying to carry not only your anxieties and worries, but you're carrying everybody else's. Some of you are carrying all of your children's anxiety and worries. Some of you are carrying all your neighbors, people at work and everything. And yes, the Bible says bear one another's burdens, but it goes on to talk about praying for one another that you carry those to the Lord, you can't handle that. I told, I told some folks the other day, I, I, and it didn't even hit me, and the Holy Spirit just brought this back to me. 
I'll never forget one time that I, I was going, man, I, I, it, there was just some hard times. And, and, and I'll never forget this. I was at my mom and dad's house, and my mom looked at me, and she said, Honey, she said, Now you quit worrying about that. I'll do all the worrying for you. And, and all of a sudden, I thought about that. And that's true because my mom was full of worry. And, and something else that you need to understand about worry and anxiety. And I could bring some of the doctors up. Anyway, I looked it up and checked it out. Anxiety can become addictive. Just like your own drugs. Anxiety will release certain chemicals. Anxiety and worry will release certain chemicals into your body that is not supposed to be released out of that action. And, and those chemicals being released in your body can literally get you to become addictive. And, and in psychology, we call it an anxiety disorder. And you're just worrying about everything. And here, here's, here, here's what I want to put a stake in that. You were not created to worry. You have the symptoms of worry. Things come that you, that, that, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm worried. The, the symptoms of anxiety and these things, they will come. But you've got to know how to deal with them. So we were not created to worry, be full of anxiety. We were not created to be miserable. We were not created to live depressed. That is the, that's the way the whole world operates. That's the way you operated before you become a born-again believer. And why do we operate like that? Listen to Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 12. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises that God had made with them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. And it's amazing to me how many people now are living with God and still living without hope. Still living in anxiety and worry. But the Bible says this. The Bible tells us and shows us that God loved us so much he changed everything. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew the 11th chapter verse 28 and 30. Then Jesus said, come to me all you that are weary and carry heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest. And the word rest there means refreshing and recreation. You will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden that I give you is light. Listen to what Jesus said again in Matthew 6, 30, 33. He says this. Now watch the word cares. Because this is so vitally important. If God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire, this is Matthew 6, 30, 33, thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care, everybody say care, he will certainly care for you. And the word care there in, indicates that he will care passionately and fervently for you. The word care there, when it, when it relates to God, means that you are the apple of his eye. His eyes are upon you. He cares about everything about you. Then Jesus said this, why do you have so little faith? Verse 31, so don't worry about these things, saying what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Well, let me say this in parenthesis, also believers. But, say thank God for the but. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. <laughs> Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. 
So, so what, what do we need? We need to change our believing and our thinking to live in peace and rest from all of our anxieties and worries. Listen to Psalms 8, chapter, verses 3 through 6. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, this is the psalmist talking about God. Man, when I look at the sky, when I look at the universe, when I look at the heavens and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals? What are we Just human beings. I mean, just this speck in the universe. What are we that you should think about them? God's thoughts are on you every single day. Human beings that, watch this, that you should, what? Care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. Ladies and gentlemen, he cares for you. Turn to somebody next to you and say, he cares for you. He cares for you passionately. Listen to this in Deuteronomy, the first chapter, verse 31, 33. And you saw... How the Lord your God cared for you all along the way as you traveled through the wilderness. Okay, we're traveling through this wilderness right now. And he cares for you. Just as a father cares for his child, now he has brought you to this place. Think about how you care for your child. You care for your children. And God is way above that. Man, you do anything for that child. Just think about that. Listen, you have a little baby, little baby's born. That little baby doesn't do anything and doesn't contribute nothing to deserve all the love and the care that it receives. It cries in the middle of the night, in the morning at 3 o'clock. It demands. It doesn't matter where you are in any restaurant whatsoever. When that child gets hungry, it's all about me. And he will let you and everybody in the restaurant know. And then that child at times will emit foul odors. And you'll pick that child up and you love him so much. Oh, did the baby do a poo poo? Listen, that child has not done one thing to earn your love and your attention and your care. But let that child make one sound. You are there. It is amazing what kind of radar that we have as parents. And it's there. It's there. It's there. That you meet that. How much more, ladies and gentlemen, God who loves you, that gave his own son. Come on, folks. That he cares for you. Listen to this. Listen, now he's brought you to this place. Notice that. Now he's brought you to this place. He said, you were going through the wilderness. Now he's brought you to this place. Listen, he's always going to bring you to the place where you need to be. And as long as you've got faith, there is nothing that can stop it. Oh, he, the devil can put obstacles. He can, he can make things look like it's, the, it's terrible. It's the worst thing in the world. You're not going to be able to accomplish this. You're not going to get this done. You're not going to achieve this. Oh, where's the money going to come from? Where is this going to come from? I'm telling you, God cares for you. He's going to take you where you need to be. And he's got all the resources. But listen, but even after all he did, you refuse to trust the Lord your God. Uh Uh-oh. Who goes before you. Listen, God goes before you. Goes before you, I love this, looking for the best places to camp. Guiding you with a pillar of fire by night and a, and a pillar of cloud by day. That, that's, that's his presence. So what am I to do with all this anxiety and worry? Let me close with this scripture. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 5 through 9. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If if you're operating in pride, then God will just allow you to kind of run your own race. I mean, he'll intervene. He'll do everything he can to 
to open your eyes of your understanding to say, no, 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 no. It's not about you. It's about me. And then I make it about you. So the word, the word resist there uh, means this. It means he opposes and he frustrates. Okay, but let me, let me show you something. You ready for this? I've never taught what I'm getting ready to say to you because God just gave it to me last week. Right in prayer, I was praying in the Spirit. All of a sudden, the Lord started speaking to me and, and opened my eyes to this. And it's this. When you carry your own worries and anxieties, that also can be a condition of pride. Self-pride. How, how do I mean that? It means this. You say, I, I, I can carry it. I can handle this. I'm not bringing you in. I can handle this. That's a sense of pride. I can do this. I can do this on my own. Now, there are some things that you have to do. It says, cast your care upon the Lord. Okay, we know, know that, cast your care upon the Lord. There are certain things you can't do. You can't sit in your house, in your air conditioning, and seeing your yard, your grass grow, and just say, I'm going to cast that upon the Lord. No. It'll look like a jungle. No, you can't just say, I'm going to cast that upon the Lord. You know, you, you can't get up in the morning and say, I don't have to brush my teeth. I'm just going to cast that upon the Lord. No, you're going to stink. You're going to have bad breath. No, you need to brush your teeth, gargle, floss. <laughs> do the things that you know that you do. And you can't do this as parents. Well, I'm just going to give angels charge over my kids. They'll, they, the, the angels will take care of them when they're growing up. No, that's your responsibility. Yeah, you can give angels charge over them to, to watch over and protect them as long as you're doing your responsibility. You can't give angels charge to raise your children. That is your responsibility. Angels, you go in there. I just cast this care of changing that poopy diaper. You go, go in there and change it. That ain't going to happen. Your house will stink for a long time. Are y'all listening to me? So what am I supposed to do? When I get into a place that there is something that I cannot handle that is bigger than me, okay, then I am going to take that, whatever it is, my finances or anything else. If I'm working and something happens, I'm going to cast that care upon the Lord. Everything that is above what I can produce, I am going to cast it upon the Lord, and I'm going to cast it quickly on God. He says, God resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself. And humility means this, just simply trusting and being obedient. Trust, listen to this. Here's where we get in trouble. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. So when I lean to my own understanding that I'm going to carry the worry, I'm going to carry the anxiety, I'm going to, all, uh, you know, I'm going to care about all of this, you're leaning to your own understanding. So basically, you're leaning to your own abilities. And in doing that, what you'll start doing is putting things together to make it happen. And then you can really mess up. So be sober. Be vigilant. Listen, that humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all, how many? All. all your care, all your worry, all your anxiety. Immediately cast it upon him. And why do you cast it upon him? Because he cares for you. And then he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. You only resist him when you have humbled yourself and cast your care upon the Lord. And then what do you do when you're resisting him? You're resisting all the thoughts he's putting in your mind to bring you back into worry and to take the care. Resist him steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Did you get that? Did you get that? Did you get that? Cast, cast, cast. Lord, I cast this upon you. In other words, the word cast there means to place upon. Lord, I just, I just cast this upon you right now. 
I, I cast this need upon you right now. I cast this situation that I'm not going to sit around here and worry about my kids. I, you're going to take care of them. You're, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do as a parent, but you're going to take care of them. I cast that care upon you. You know, they're going on a mission trip somewhere. I cast that care upon you, Lord. Can you say amen? amen. And you say amen. 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 